Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host as always, Steve Hall, and I am welcomed today by Shelby Starnes. Hopefully some of you at least know who Shelby is. Um, He might not be directly within a lot of the typical people that we have on the podcast, um, but I think he should be. And I think he should be introduced to you guys and that is why we have him on the show because I think he has an incredible amount of value to add to the show and to you guys. So to give a bit of background behind Shelby, he is a champion bodybuilder himself um, in the IFBB and in the NPC. If you just Google him, Google bodybuilding, you'll see an incredible physique. Uh, Shelby looked tremendous. He was also part of the team Elite FTS and uh, he over there often is answering people's questions and things. And he has a fantastic Instagram account, which I think many of you would benefit from following. I really enjoy following him over there. And he has a degree in psychology. So uh, he is a very smart individual and I think he's going to give a lot of value to you guys. Is there anything you want to add there, Shelby? That's, you've, you've already overstated my importance. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just talking off air that actually Shelby and Mike Isretel, obviously someone else who is regularly on the show, uh, know each other, know one another. I know as I'd heard uh, Mike reference Shelby a few times and it's a, it's a small world. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. So Shelby, your skills, I think, at least dominated on Instagram are some incredible transformations of people going through contest prep, um, especially some females getting unbelievably lean, coming in fantastic condition, and also just some very good advice for competitors in the off season and in contest prep um, that I think is often missed by a lot of people. And I think this is something that would be incredibly valuable for our audience. Um, And obviously you're an incredibly successful coach and you've taken many people to stage who have done incredibly well. And I'd love to know what you would say are kind of some key things you think for a successful prep Um, that might be kind of starting out or kind of it might anything. It could be anything to do with a contest prep. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think um, I think one of the reason one of the reasons that I think that people like what I post, or the people that or at least the people that do like what I post, the the feedback that I get is that I think I try to be uh, fairly realistic and um, speak the truth, and maybe sometimes touch on things that aren't necessarily the most glamorous aspects. Uh, sometimes they're, they're either neglected or, uh, you know, not talked about for various reasons, um, or just things that people, maybe people tend not to notice, um, just due to our own cognitive biases for whatever reason. Um, so I try to, as much as I can, uh, I, I try to tease some of those things out and offer my advice and, and, and input. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. I have a, a handful, uh, a, a good amount of experience, uh, working with a, a variety of different physiques. Um, so I t- t- try to tease out some of the, the commonalities, some of the, the, the common, common pitfalls. Um, and, and, but, but I mean, also not just to focus on the negatives, um, to, 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 what are the common, you know, success stories mm-hmm. too? You know, the, the people, the people that succeed. What are their? What's the common denominator there? Um, and just as a side note, I have a dog on my lap now. So if there's oh, any, <laughs> there's a blind, a blind female Boston Terrier on my lap as oh. we speak. Be helping me. She'll, she'll be helping guide my answers uh, <laughs> some way. So, anyways, a successful. A successful prep, um, I mean, that's such a broad question. Uh, you know, it can mean so much. Um, you know, some of the so, so some of the biggest issues that I see with contest prep, uh, people having uh, problems are starting off with not enough muscle mass. You know, maybe they start training. Uh, maybe they're a young guy, uh, you know, a teenager or early twenties and they want to compete. They, their friends compete, the guys in their gym compete and, you know, they see it on social media, uh, 
uh, you know, Instagram and whatnot. Hey, I want to be a competitor. Hey, I want to do bodybuilding or men's physique, classic physique, whatever. Uh, but they don't necessarily have enough time under their belt. They haven't really built up enough muscle mass. Um, so obviously you need to spend some time building that, that framework. Um, I'm not a fan of, I mean, myself, when I first got into it, I waited quite a while to compete. Um, and something that often went through my head was I I don't want to compete until I'm, I'm big enough until I'm good enough. And you know, that's, you can definitely take it in the opposite direction and wait too long. I, I, I think there's kind of a sweet spot. Um, I think you need to, to have spend some time building a base, have some muscle mass, but also don't get caught up in I'm not going to compete until I know I can win yeah. the overall and, and turn pro and head to the Olympia stage. Because once I did, once I did start competing, uh, it really helped my level of progression. Fine. Um, it, it allowed me to, I mean, it served as a, a much bigger motivator because I knew I was going to step on stage again, you know, nine to 12 months later. Um, it just kind of put me into that scene and I started hanging out with other competitors, you know, researching it more. It just got right. me more in that mindset than if I didn't. If I was constant, you know, and, I, and I'm not, I don't want to say you're a perma bulker if you never if you never compete, but I mean, if you're in that, if you, if you never compete, if you're always waiting to compete, there's just a whole bunch of, uh, knowledge that you're not getting and, and, uh, and, and you're not learning about until you start, you know, diving in, diving into that level. So, I mean, if if we want to put a number on it, I would say probably be weight training for at least a few years. Cool. Yeah. Uh, You know, consistently, you know, not just, Hey, I, I, I did some weight training in high school or this and, and that, but like some consistent, I would say two or three years is good depending on what division you're going to compete in. Obviously, if you're going to compete in men's physique, that's, that's a little bit, there's a, a little bit, a lower bar of muscularity re- required yeah. for men's physique as, 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 uh, compared to bodybuilding. And then also you have to go by your your motivation level. If you're a diehard bodybuilder and you only want to compete in bodybuilding, but you're a beginner, then yeah, it's going to take you longer. Maybe you mm-hmm. need to spend you know three four years instead of one or two years or whatever. And you know a lot of it depends on your genetics as well. Of course, you know some people are more mesomorphic or or whatever you want to whatever term you want to throw at it. Some people just progress faster than others. Yeah. Uh, so that plays a role as well. So that's, you know, that's talking about a beginner starting into a contest prep, um, have, have a few years under your belt. Uh, I, I I think it's really important to surround yourself with people that are doing what you want to do are at the level that you want to get to, uh, you know, et cetera, uh, surround yourself you know you're you're the uh, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with so uh if, if you want to be a high level competitor you need you know you need to spend time hanging around other competitors lear- lear- learning from competitors um not not just people that uh that that train and don't compete um and then once once you've been competing for a while uh, another, another big mistake that I see people make is competing too frequently. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is especially more common with females. Um, and this is, there's a variety of reasons for this. I think social media, social media is a big one now. Um, we're, 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 women always want to stay in shape so they can always be posting yeah. good pics. Maybe, maybe, maybe they've got photo shoots, maybe they don't, but they're posting, you know, their own videos, you know, of their training, uh, pics, whatever. Um, and so they're not, you know, they're often not giving themselves ample time between shows to let their metabolism recover, uh, ample time to make progress, um, ample, they're often not eating enough uh, to let to let themselves get back to a good uh, you know caloric level to let hormones reverse get in a good spot make progress etc. 
they'll, they'll do a contest and then, oh, three months later, there's, I see there's, there's this other one that my, my girlfriend's doing and we're, you know, I, I want to do what my buddy's doing and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm already in kind of good shape. So it's 12 weeks, like, why not do that one? So you end up, they end up doing, you know, because, because they've got all these hormonal adaptations uh, in their body that have thrown them off from the first diet. They're fighting, they're fighting against those for their, the second diet. So they end up having to cut calories even lower, Mm -hmm. having to do, having to do more cardio. Uh, If they're using supplements, maybe they have to use more supplements, more thyroid or whatever fat burners. Um, And it just ends up being this, they, they keep digging themselves into a deeper hole, a deeper and deeper hole. And it's a vicious cycle. And until they spend some time getting out of that, uh, reversing out of that and being at a, uh, you know, a, a sustainable, normal body fat level for, for a while, they're not going to make any progress. And they're just going to keep on shooting themselves in the foot and making successive perhaps harder and harder and harder. So those are, those are two big ones. Um, having ample muscle mass and then having ample time between shows. Uh, I, I guess another, another big one would be having a, having, being at a good, and this plays into the last one, but being at a good caloric level, mm-hmm. uh, to start into prep, you know, you don't, the off season, the off season, you should be looking to make improvements in your physique, um, getting stronger, uh, you know, bringing up weak points and getting yourself metabolically hormonally in a strong position. Yep. Uh, you know, calories should be, you spend some time getting calories up high while keeping your body fat reasonable. Um, you know, there's, there's a sweet spot or a sweet range uh, between being too lean that you're not allowing yourself to recover and being overly fat where you're, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's other hormonal adaptations that come from being overly fat. And it's also just, I mean, the, any fat you gain eventually has to come off. So, Mm -hmm. um, there's a sweet range there. Uh, so starting prep, you want to be eating a good amount of, a, a good amount of food. So you've got, room to play with, uh, as you get into the prep. Um, and then depending on your own, depending on your metabolism, your personal metabolism, depending on if you're assisted or not assisted, uh, these things will determine the duration of your prep, when to start, when to start, uh, dieting for a certain show. You know, you, you might say, I mean, an ideal situation an ideal situation would be, you know, you, you, you're in a healthy spot. You've got good blood work. I always recommend getting blood work done. Make sure cool. your, make sure your, your hormones are in a good spot and then say, Hey, I think we're in a good spot that we could do a show in 24 weeks or something like that. So let's see what's available. And then we can start easing into our diet via, you know, various, various means um, I, that's, that's an ideal situation and an in ideal situation would be, Hey Shelby, there's a show in nine weeks. Um, and it, it looks good. You know, my girlfriend's doing it. Uh, can we do this one? Like it, 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 it it's always much better to pick, pick a date based on what your body and what your body's doing. than try to do it the other way around, try to make your body f- try to make your body fit into some preset date or whatever. Um, those are some big ones that just come to mind off the top of my head. Do those, do those uh, trigger any questions or comments in your head? Yeah. I think just the, to, in my head to summarize that it's a, I mean, it's basically being the competitor, but in a healthy spot because when you're lean at the kind of competitive levels, you're not healthy. You basically want to be kind of have the muscle mass and be in a good, healthy spot. So you talked about kind of metabolic health, but also not being too overly fat, being in a place where you can realistically get to stage. Because I think, like you said, the people that compete too often, they've still got 
issues with their kind of nutrition. Maybe they're not on high enough calories to give them enough room to play with. Maybe they've got poor diet habits. They're kind of not eating the best way. They're still kind of lagging some of those diet fatigue factors that we kind of pick up during our contest prep. So, no, I think the the brilliant points. And um, my, I guess a question that came into my head was when you are going through a contest prep, is there anything you're doing to try and keep that person as healthy as possible? Any like refeeds or diet uh, breaks uh, protocols? Do you use any of those in your contest preps? Uh, definitely. And that's a very, um, it's a very individual thing, of course. One thing I want to mention before I answer that and remember to re answer, don't let me forget that question if I go off on a tangent. But, um, Everything that I'm talking about here applies both to uh, assisted and unassisted competitors. Um, I think, I think generally speaking, your podcast is a little bit more on the unassisted side, mm-hmm. um, you know, based on uh, some of the guests that you've had. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people on the unassisted side, and I'm, I don't, I don't want to pigeonhole anyone, but a lot of the people on the unassisted side think, oh, they're assisted. They can do whatever they want. Um, and there's definitely an advantage to being assisted and you get a lot of leeway in things, but you still have to pay attention to all this stuff. And mm-hmm. it's certainly, it's certainly still a very tricky game of, of balancing, uh, hormones, metabolism, fatigue factors, all these different things that you've mentioned, and they can all be very individual. There's not just like, sometimes people will ask me, Hey, how do you diet a natural? How do you diet an assisted lifter? And I'm like, there is that's, it doesn't work like that. Like it's how do I diet Joe versus John versus Mary versus Linda? They're all completely different and individual factors play a much bigger role than just assisted versus unassisted. Um, so that's, that's a big thing that I think a lot of people misunderstand, mis- misconstrue. Um, in terms of refeeds, a diet breaks, things like that, um, a diet break, like a full-on diet break, and when I think diet break, I think something more along the lines of, uh, you know, like something like Lyle McDonald has, uh, I've seen him talk about it before, where you're doing like a one-week or a two-week. Right. A longer break where you're coming at least back up to maintenance calories um, for a certain length of time. I won't usually do that during a contest prep because time is of the essence. Right. I mean, that's that's more of a like if you've got a, a longer time period. You know, if you're on like a six, nine, twelve month type program and and you're doing something longer, someone with a lot of fat to lose that's on a longer program. But 16 weeks or, or less, or you know, even 20 weeks or less, you often don't have time to. Mm-hmm. You often don't have time to have a full week off, um, and hopefully you're starting off in a good enough position that you, you know, in terms of food and and or in hormones, that you shouldn't really need a big long break like that, you know, in, anytime soon. But implementing refeeds, um, that's something that you just you have to have something in there, whether, whether or not that's a, a cheat meal or a, a full day refeed or, you know, a two day refeed. Um, there's, there's many, many ways to set it up. Mm-hmm. And some people, some people respond better to, to certain ones than others. And you might implement certain ones at, at, at certain points in the prep and others at other points in the prep. And then of course you always have to take into consideration the mentality of the competitor. You know, some people will say, Hey, don't give me a cheat meal. Right. Cause I'll, I'll, I'm going to mess it up. You know, give me some clean carbs or tell me specifically what to eat or, you know, so those, that's another factor. There's always myriad factors in, in deciding any of this stuff, implementing any of this stuff. But I mean, the answer is yes. You've mm-hmm. got to have, you got to have something in there that's going to at least, to a certain extent, help with the down regulation of hormones that get 
messed up from mm-hmm. dieting. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people think, oh, dieting, it's healthy. Like, you know, it's, it, and it's, and it is, you know, but you have to, you have to remember that dieting is, is not really eating healthy is a, is a good state to be in all the time, but being hypocaloric is not a natural state for the body and it doesn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't want to be shredded. It doesn't want to go there. It's not a normal place to be. So you've got all these hormonal responses that are saying, you know, screw you within, within days of starting a diet. You know, I mean, sometimes some, some of them can start within a day or two. It's not, you know, it's not something that only only happens after you've been dieting for two weeks or three weeks or whatever. Mm-hmm. So those are always those are always things to be aware of and uh, try to manage as best as possible. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think maybe that's something that I'm. I think you probably agree with this as well. I just thought it was worth highlighting that you've things we're talking about here. Our audience have a good awareness of what a contest prep entails. But just thinking to someone who was a new competitor looking to get on stage, I'd probably say someone who has some awareness of what contest prep is actually going to entail, what to expect when you're going through it is probably something that you'd you'd want them to have, especially as a first time competitor. When you're just going into it completely ignorant, I think that can be like a, a really bad way to go into it. Definitely. And I think something that you've done really well there with all of your answers is just how everything I, I, you as a coach, you customize everything because everything is so individual. And whilst on the surface level, humans are humans, we're very, very similar. There's so many different nuances. So whilst, yes, refeeds might be a strategy that you're saying you use, they're going to be different for every single person. And um, something I'd be interested in, and I know you work with quite a lot of female competitors. Are there any big differences you see between kind of taking a female competitor or a male competitor stage in physiology or psychology? as a coach for you? Um, you know, the, the female versus male thing is interesting because initially when I started coaching, I worked with both. I mean, I, I still work with both. Um, but I, I, I worked with both initially. And then there was a point about eight years ago where females, I, I, I was getting to the point where females were baffling me. I like I I didn't feel comfortable dieting a female and I I almost was to the point where I said I'm not going to work with females anymore because I feel like I feel like I wasn't doing a good, a good enough job of it um and then a year or two later something clicked or switched and I started having really good success with females um and then it just snowballed uh I mean, once you, how social media works, if you have success with a couple clients and other people find out that you have success with a couple clients, they want to, they want to be that client, you know, and then you get more pros and more pros. And I'm to the point now I prefer working with females. I actually don't want to work with competitive males anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll work with, I'll work with non-competitive males, you know, males that aren't going to step on stage. Um, but in terms of competitors, I really only work, want to work with females at this point. And honestly, a big part of that is the psychological factor. And I, I, I am surely not trying to say all males are one way and all females are another way because that's definitely not the case. But generally speaking, I find females a lot easier to work with. Um, I think they have less of an ego ish, less of an ego. I mean, that's the biggest, Mm -hmm. easiest. If if you just had to sum it down to, you know, one thing, females are easier to work with because they have less of an ego about everything. Mm -hmm. At least, at least the competitors. Again, there's some females that are competitors that I don't like working with. They've got more of an ego. And there's some males competitors that are great to work with. But, you know, on, on an average, I find that females are a little bit more trusting um, and, and, and just have less of an ego about everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and at this point I've worked with so many females and I've had success with a lot of females that it's just my niche and it's easier for me to work with a female. Like Mm -hmm. I'm already, it's like task switching. Yeah. Like male, like I'm not usually thinking of a dude that weighs 250 pounds or whatever. I'm thinking, you know, gals that are on stage at 130 or whatever, you know. So it's it's just uh, it's easier for me, and I and just I find it, I don't know, it, it works easier for me to just focus on one sector than try to be jack of all trades or whatever. I pr- I prefer women's physique and figure. Mm-hmm. So these are these are the more muscular divisions and low body fat. I I don't work with bikini clients. That's not my interest. Um, I work with some women's bodybuilding clients as well. That 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 divisions not as popular as, mm-hmm. as figure as physique. Um, but yeah, that's the, the, the biggest answer is I like working with females for what I would probably deem as psychological factors. And then also just it, it's easier for me at this mm-hmm. point. No, it makes complete sense. Like specialization, I guess it's a, a well-known kind of historical like thing that people do, you get better at doing a certain thing. So it makes sense to go down that niche. I'd be interested then if we even like took it one further with the females you work with, have you got any examples of like quite extreme differences between clients, whether or not you had to take calories really low for one individual or anything that's kind of very different just so that people listening in know that there's like big individuality even between kind of all different females? Well, to... I'll, I'll give a couple examples cool. here, or two two things come to mind. Um, one one thing that comes to mind is that certain people, and this is males or females, certain people seem to respond much better to either a reduction in carbohydrate or a reduction in fat when dieting. Um, everybody needs protein. You know, there's no bodybuilder that's mm-hmm. on a, a a low protein diet. Um, but some people seem to do better with lowering fat close to zero and keeping some amount of, of carbohydrate in while other people are the opposite. They do better with, you know, low, low carbs and a little bit more fat in the diet. And this is kind of funny because it, I mean, if you look at the science, science says, oh, it's, you know, just equate for calories yeah. and, you know, as long as this, but science is, Science is, I mean, I love science. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not dissing science. Mm-hmm. I love it. But science doesn't get down to the individual nitty gritty and cover, you know, science is more looking at broad trends. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's not much science on getting people inside out shredded for contests, you know, down to these in, in, inhuman body fat levels. Um, you know, I mean, for I, there was just, I mean, I saw people posting studies recently or this meta-analysis or whatever that came out that said, you know, generally speaking, low carb or low low fat, it doesn't matter. And I would say that for the average person, for the average person trying to lose weight, yeah, generally speaking, do what you want. But once you're getting down into the nitty gritty and trying to get lower than normal body fat levels, you're probably going to find that some people will respond better to one way than the other. I mean, I've, I've certainly seen that. I, I did some rough number crunching a few years ago. And at that time I had worked with roughly 10,000 clients, wow. which, um, I'm still learning all the time. I'm going to be learning until the day I die, but 10,000 people is a that's a decent study size. Yeah. You know, that's a decent sample for, for me to, make some conclusions from and obviously towards you know more recently I'm probably picking up a little bit more on stuff than I necessarily was in the beginning of yeah. my career and that's that's a trend that will continue until I die um, but I mean I think I've picked up on some stuff so and I, I mean there's certainly people that respond better to, to to one than the other so I okay I think I I think I killed that one some people respond better to, to lower carb versus lower fat. Uh, and that's just an individual thing that you just kind of need to experiment with and, and figure out for yourself. It does mm-hmm. not 
it does not take that long does not take that long to figure out which you respond better to um and this is going to be you know subjective feeling just how you feel you know how's your training how's your energy level um and also progress wise you know what's your body composition doing right um and that's not that's not to say though that if you respond better to a lower carb diet that you indefinitely do that Mm -hmm. you need to have you know these refeeds and whatnot same thing for for lower fat and then the other the other uh, thing that came to mind is, and this is basically just metabolism. Mm. Um, some people have much uh, faster metabolisms than others and can eat much more, much more food and 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 get shredded. You know, I if we did blood work, these people with faster metabolisms, their thyroid hormones are probably all much more conducive to losing fat, but also things like, uh, IGF, Mm -hmm. testosterone, you know, you know, estrogen and progesterone are probably, you know, more ideal. Uh, testosterone is a big one, you know, a, 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 a number of hormonal factors like that. Um, like carving up for a show, I have some people, I have some women, I have some women that, well, it, it, it takes a very low amount of carbohydrate for them to carbo, to right. carb up for a show. Like if they did a hundred or 200 grams of carbs wow. in a day, one or two days and they're full and tight and they're fine. If they did much more than that, they'd spill over. And I mean, these are women that are not tiny. I mean, mm-hmm. they're 130, they're 130 pounds at a very low body fat. Um, but it doesn't take much carbohydrate for them to fill out. I have other women that are not much bigger that can do a thousand grams of carbohydrate wow. for three to, yeah. three days in a, three days in a row, three, four, five days in a row. I mean, that's more than some males. Yeah, a lot of uh, males. <laughs> that's, that's more than most males. Let's say that <laughs> more than most males. Um. So yeah, the the individual variability in dieting and carving up in everything can just be drastic. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, you know, the longer I, the longer I work with someone, the, the, the better I, the better I learn their body and the better I'm able to play with those things. No, really interesting. And, um, I definitely think, especially when you're in a, a calorie deficit state, you can notice like even, sometimes like small changes in fat to carb ratios, they can be quite apparent because you're just in that dieted state and everything's just a bit more reactive. Um, and the differences in metabolism is... Sorry. Especially when you're... Yeah. So, right. yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry, more so lean because obviously the body fat percentage is lower because everything, yeah, it's just more of a, a reactive state. And I think something you talked about there was obviously the carb up differences it might be interesting to hear if do you have like a a standard or not a standard obviously it's different for every individual but a preferred way to go about kind of carving up or like the peak week um if we can call it that yeah that's it's so individual i mean i i i talk about that a lot a lot like you know maybe i've got five people competing on one weekend mm-hmm. and they're all, they're all on something very different um, you know, this, this goes down to metabolism, uh, metabolism is a big one. I, I usually, I when, whenever possible, I like doing test runs, trial runs yeah. of, of the, uh, the carb up or it, it might not be a full blown 100% exact run, but it's at least, uh, you know, a good rough cut. Um, maybe two, three, four weeks out to see how they respond. And you, you need to look at a, a number of things. I mean, full, fullness and dryness are what a lot of people pay attention to. I mean, those are the two big ones, fullness and dryness. But another big one that can play a role in what you do is um, – your, what your stomach's doing. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about distension. Mm. Uh, a lot of people 
when you carve them up, they might end up full and dry, but their stomach is is bloated for whatever reason, more so than another person that did the same exact thing. Um, so someone, you know, someone that has stomach distension issues, they might do better loading a little bit earlier in the week. You're going to hold your load for, a, you know, a few days or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of days, especially if you're not, you know, training excessively or whatever. So someone like that, um, you might load earlier in the week and then taper it back, you know, the day before the show or whatever. Uh, so that's another variable that can change what you do. Generally speaking, I like loading just the last day or two, unless it's someone that I know takes multiple days. Right. Uh, you know, I've got some females that need four or five days of, of loading, uh, in high amounts, you know, seven, eight, even a thousand grams of carbs, um, to really fill out. But that's there, that's kind of an anomaly. Um, but you need to figure those things out because those anomalies, if, if I, I mean, if I, if I put all of my final week plans together and then found an average, mm -hmm. uh, and then said, this is what everyone does, it, it would maybe, I'd maybe get 15% of the results mm -hmm. that I do. <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't have very many wins yeah. that way. Um, but those anomalies would fall through the cracks yeah. and, and they would look dismal. You know, they'd look flat or, you know, some would spill over. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely an individual thing. Mm -hmm. I think what you said there in terms of having somewhat of a practice run, even if it's not exactly it, just some idea of kind of, are they responding kind of quickly to carbohydrates or not this amount? Um, I think that tells you a lot. I think that was key. Also just during, I mean, during your diet, during your prep, you're going to get input on how someone responds. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, if you've got, if you've got some sort of weekly refeed, you're going to see, oh, they look, great the next day or maybe they look great two days later or, you know what's their stomach doing what's their water retention doing or oh you're looking watery but yesterday you only drank three liters of water like why did you know why did you do that like let's fix that so we don't have some confounding factor that makes us think something else is going on when it was just a simple matter of drinking another two liters of water and everything looks flush and you know tight so I, you know, during prep, I like looking at people pretty frequently, Okay. you know, and when I, I start off, I start off looking at like, like in the off season, I just do once a week. I know some people like to go less frequent than that, like every two weeks or something. Um, I find that generally I think once a week is a little better just to keep a closer eye on things. And I think it helps with motivation uh, for someone too, and accountability to know that they're checking in once a week, two weeks, uh, in my opinion, is a little bit too long. Anyways, pre-contest, you know, if we're starting at 20 weeks out or 16 weeks out, I might start off uh, by pushing those check-ins closer to maybe every four days or every five days. And then as we get closer to the show, it's going to be more frequent every, you know, every three days, every two days. Sometimes I want to see you every, you know, the last week, last couple of weeks, I might be asking for picks every day. I might be asking for picks a couple times a day, you know, keeping, keeping a close eye on things. The, the more, the more information and the more data you can get, uh, is the more helpful it is. Uh, as, as long as you're, in, intelligent about it. I mean, obviously too much data can be confusing for some people, but I mean, if you're, uh, if you know what you're looking at, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. no, I completely agree. I think the degree of changes, the closer you get to stage, the bigger they are, every kind of, not even every pound, less than a pound, but like you could stay stable in body weight and the, the body could change dramatically through different variables. Like, like you said, it could be carbohydrates, sodium, water intake, loads of things can have an impact. So yeah, it becomes so important to get, and that's the most important thing. How are you looking like scale weight can only tell you so much. All these other things can only tell you so much is important how they look. That's what wins them kind of the trophies, how they look. So really interesting. And I don't know if you've got any, um, 
anything you've kind of seen, maybe, I don't know if it's common or just you see it happen too frequently where people screw up a peak week? Is there any kind of common things you see that people just maybe they over overemphasize certain elements or just don't think about something? Um, I don't know if I have a good answer there because I don't run into people that are doing it wrong. That's you know, there is, <laughs> if they're doing something wrong, they're not talking yeah. to people. And the people that are working with me, I'm making sure that they do it right. I mean, I mean that I mean the common the common things that you hear about people doing wrong are these archaic water tapering and water cut cutting methods where they're not drinking water for days on end or you know cutting sodium uh, you know keeping sodium out, keeping sodium out the whole prep you know, mm. keeping sodium up the whole final week, things like that. I think most of your listeners are probably aware of yeah, of those type of mistakes. Um, but nothing else really, nothing else really comes to mind. Okay. And something I'd be interested here, your take on is obviously getting that person to that position They you need to get them shredded. What's your, obviously we talked about carbohydrates and fats and protein and we're creating that calorie deficit. Do you utilize cardio as well? What's your approach there? Kind of do you use like low intensity, like high intensity or any at any or as little as possible? What's your kind of thoughts on cardio? Um, I definitely use cardio. Uh, cardio is a, a big tool and, and, and quite often you need to create a bigger calorie deficit than you might want to with diet alone. Um, but cardio is, you know, it's you're looking for the minimum effective dose. Cool. Uh, you you want to use as little as possible, but that's not to say that you do as little as you want. Mm -hmm. You do as little as is necessary. It's a minimum effective dose. The the emphasis is on effective, not minimum. Uh, so some people need more than others, and this can this can uh, be dictated by their metabolism, by their body fat level, by their timeline. Timeline is timeline is a huge factor in setting up diet that I think is often overlooked or at least not often talked about is, you know, people say, okay, what's the perfect diet for this or that? Um, you know, what, what should my cardio be? What should my diet be? And it's like, like, well, if you have to be on stage in eight weeks versus 24 weeks, the answer is completely different. Um, so timeline is a, is a huge one. I, I like, I, I generally like using, um, a combination of both low intensity and some hit interval cardio, uh, hit can be very, very effective. Um, it's very, um, what's the word time, time efficient. Um, but too much can definitely zap someone, mm -hmm. um, you know, it can zap your nervous system, can detract from training. Uh, I think it can create a lot of fear and anxiety uh, mentally for people, which is never a good thing pre-contest. You've already got you've already got hormones working against you, so don't try not to layer on top of that. Um, but sometimes, you know, push comes to shove. Sometimes you've got to implement quite a lot, just depending on how your body is responding and, and, and again, what your timeline is. Uh, some people don't need any hit cardio. Some people can get away with just low intensity, moderate intensity. Myself, I never did any hit cardio when I competed. Um, I always walked on a treadmill at three miles an hour and zero incline, and I would just increase the duration. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people are are not so lucky. Yeah. Uh, some people have to do a little bit more. So, but yeah, I'm I'm not afraid to use cardio as needed. But I'm not someone I'm not someone that's. Or I'd like to think that I'm not someone that's, uh, you know, loves throwing a ton of cardio at people. I I, I will say also that I like starting off. I guess this is uh, reiterating what I've already said, but just start off with as little cardio as possible. Sometimes I hear about people starting a prep and they their their coach jumps them right into two or three hours a day and they're 16 weeks out, like they're going to get a head start. And I'm like, get a head start on completely fucking up your metabolism and hormones? Like, is that what you're trying to do? Like, 
I, I, I don't see that as an intelligent approach. Um, you just, you want to, as much as possible, you want to coax the body yeah. uh, in, into the composition changes. Um, cause your body, your body knows what you're doing to it. You can't, it's hard to trick the body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and the more aggressive you are, the more, it, the more it fights back. Um, so I like, I like starting cardio as, as low as possible and just gradually increasing as needed. Sometimes we'll do cardio breaks, you know, similar to a, a diet break or whatever. It's not, it's usually not for very long, but sometimes you can take a day or two off, let the body, uh, recover a bit. So. No, awesome. Um, and then the only other question I guess related to that I had was uh, you mentioned La McDonald. He had like a, a stubborn fat protocol and women are traditionally difficult to get lean within kind of the lower half. Quite often the upper half comes in and then the lower half is still kind of like a bit soft. Is there anything you've ever found? I don't know what's consistent maybe among some of your competitors or anything you've had to try to get that lower half in or is it just a case of just longer time dieting? Um, it, it's not always lower. It's not always just longer time. I mean, cause you can be on the wrong diet and do it for five years and <laughs> never, never get the results you want. It, I mean, time, time is a factor, but it's certainly not, uh, the only factor. Um, you know, lower body, body fat percentage, uh, you know, w- women with glutes that won't come in, you know, stubborn hips, saddlebags, that area, you know, a, a, a lot of that is hormonal, you know, uh, and so you, you can attack it from a, a hormonal perspective and, and, and try to do things to, you know, like take estrogen blockers, right. you know, they're, if you're in, a, if you're an assisted if you're in the assisted realm, there are estrogen blockers that can assist with that. But even still, there are many assisted lifters that take estrogen blockers that still have a bitch of a time getting those areas in. Um, I have found that while estrogen blockers help, it really just comes down to dieting pretty, pretty hard, (laughs) a a, a pretty big caloric deficit, unless you're just someone that, you know, is, is naturally, uh, gifted in those areas. A lot of, a lot of times it just comes down to driving the calories down, you know, so that's diet and that's cardio. Um, maybe it's a low insulin environment, you know, it, you know, some people respond better than that to others. Uh, generally speaking, someone that has stubborn fat like that, I'm probably going to try a lower carb approach with them initially. Um, but again, they're going to need periodic carbs. They're going to need carbs to support training. They're going to need some carbs periodically, at least to, you know, help with cortisol and glyc, you know, muscle glycogen to support training, yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, but a lot of it, I, I really, I'll, I'll get people that come to me that have already, I mean, these are assisted lifters that have gone through preps and used every drug under the sun, but never had their, never had their glutes come in. And a lot of times I'll actually reduce their supplement intake, the, the extra stuff, the extracurriculars, and just push them a little bit differently or a little harder on the mm-hmm. diet and cardio and boom, suddenly they're seeing results. You know, maybe they were doing these massive carb ups once a week that they shouldn't have done. Maybe they were eating just, you know, an an extra few hundred calories that they needed to dip below to get the results that they needed and then stay there consistently for a week or two and not just jump at a refeed because they felt a little flat and had a shitty workout. Like, Hey, maybe you need to have a shitty workout for, you know, five days in a row. Like maybe that's just part of the deal for you. Maybe that's you know, the hand you were dealt and then, and then you can refeed. Like maybe you just need to be pushed a little bit harder than you have before. Um, and that goes for, that goes for un, uh, natural lifters yeah. as well. I mean, there are some natural supplements that you can imp- implement to help 
with the stubborn fat areas like dim, um, you know, him being things like this. I just don't think that these are massive game changers. Mm -hmm. I see, I see them helping a little bit. What I see helping a lot is pushing the diet and cardio hard, but intelligently, because it's not just about who can diet hardest. You know, it's not a matter of, Hey, let's drop down to 600 calories or 800 calories and stay there forever. Um, you know, it has to be, you have to push hard and smart. Mm -hmm. uh, so. No, I, re I really like the answer. Really well balanced, really well explained. Um, I think people often look for, they want to, uh, they kind of, they might not like this answer. I like it because I, I very much think of the, the kind of same way and that sometimes you do just need to dig that a little bit harder. But sometimes to get to dig that harder, you need to have done it in a smart way because sometimes pushing harder doesn't, like you said, you need to coax it in some ways. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting, tricky thing. <laughs> and it's always compounded by mental factors. Yes that uh that don't often steer us in the right direction no definitely and um shelby the last thing i wanted to finish on and uh, i think it's we're going to be really valuable because i think we have a lot of coaches that listen to this podcast and you're obviously a successful coach yourself and um, i think you've given away quite a lot in terms of what actually allows you to be successful in that you're very kind of meticulous individualization is really key for you but if there's anything you would want to say to the audience in terms of what makes a good coach what are kind of like maybe a couple of points that you think are, make you a good coach or maybe you see in other good coaches um i think caring is a big one uh you need to, to care about <laughs> the the, the progress of your clients, the, the best, I mean, bodybuilding is an inter, is an interesting thing. The, the people that are driven to bodybuilding and that do well in bodybuilding are usually pretty OCD. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of type one. Mm -hmm. They're very, dri dri very driven people, very obsessive compulsive people. And that's, that's the type of personality that also makes a good coach. So, you know, if, and that's not to say that every good bodybuilder is a good coach. Cause that's, that's definitely mm -hmm. not, not the case. Um, but the same, some of those same things that can make you good at bodybuilding, uh, can also make you good, good at coaching. Um, I, I, I think coaching a lot just comes down to experience. Um, you know, like I said, working with, many clients over the years. I'm a much better coach now than I was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And with any luck, with any luck, I'll be a much better coach 10 years from now than I am today. Uh, you know, I'm constantly trying to, to learn and evolve and, and be a better coach to my clients. You have to start somewhere though. You're not going to start off with 10,000 clients under your belt. So you, you have to start off somewhere. Um, you know, you've, you've got to learn as much as you can. I, I worked with a variety of my, a, a variety of different coaches myself during my competitive years. And I learned, I learned a lot of different styles for not, not just dieting and training and supplementation, all that stuff. But I also learned a lot of different coaching styles. Right. Um, and, 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 and I, and so I was able to say, Hey, I like this about this guy's coaching style. I don't like this about this guy's coaching style. Um, and I think, th I think a, a, another big thing is, is keeping an open mind and realizing, uh, realizing one that no two clients are alike. I mean, I, I, often you have to start a client, you have to start a client with something. So you're going to start them with some somewhat, generic plan but as you go through the days and weeks this is going to morph into something that's customized to their situation so you know re realize that everyone's different and realize that everyone's different not just physically but also mentally um and realize that they're they might not necessarily have the same goals as as you do the coach uh i, I think coaches sometimes a, a lot of 
beginning coaches, very, very early coaches say, Hey, I, you know, I did a diet. I lost some body fat. I gained some muscle. I know how to do it. I can coach other people. And so they just, you know, Oh, you're a female. I'll just multiply it by 75%, you know, and it doesn't, unfortunately it doesn't work that way. It's a little bit trickier than that. So try not to try not to fit your clients into your own, uh, situation and that's that's physically as well as mentally um they might not have the same goals as you may they might not have the same timeline as you uh i mean treat treat everyone as a as a human being as an individual and not just a you know a number um and 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 try to as much as possible keep the long game in mind you know play the long game uh don't don't do gnarly things sacrificing people's health uh just so you can have a good before and after to put on your your social media page um so no brilliant i don't think i don't know if we need anything more than that it's uh it's obvious you care a lot for your clients and i think part of you caring is knowing that everyone is such a unique individual and you have to take care of physiological and psychological differences. So I thought that was brilliant. Well, if you want to do this for a long time, if you want to be a good coach and have a good reputation and be doing this, not just next year, but five years now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you better be good about it. You better care about people because word of mouth, yeah, word of mouth, word of mouth is much stronger than social media uh, in, in, in the long game. Mm-hmm. So, Fantastic. Um, Shelby, I want to say a massive thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been a great to talk to you and kind of dig into your brain um, about your contest prep strategies and things like this. If people want to kind of reach out to you or find more about kind of the content you're producing, where should they look? Uh, Instagram is probably the best. That's, that's the main platform I use right now for social media. My website is just my name, shelbystarns.com. Um, if you, if you Google my name, you can see articles I've written in the past, but really, really Instagram is the one I really, the only one I really use nowadays. Um, and then there's a, any, anyone can feel free to message me on Instagram if they have any questions about anything, uh, or there's a contact page on my website. They can shoot me an email or whatever. Amazing. Happy to help. I'll have that all linked below. Um, I definitely recommend people check out Shelby's Instagram. Um, it's just very interesting and they can go down your your feed and there's just so much value there to read over and uh, yeah, take a gander over all of the crazy female competitors that uh, Shelby has been producing. So yeah, thank you once again, Shelby. And thank you all for listening. We will catch you soon. My pleasure, Steve. Thank you.